All right, well, of course, the grand intro. Let's welcome everyone to Open West Conference 2013. <laughs> So of course, one of the biggest questions we want to address is this year we've got the new name, Open West, instead of Utah Open Source. That was a really important change that we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we could do it. The reason we did that is we still have the Utah Open Source Foundation, and we are actually the group that is running the conference. But we needed to change the name to reflect what this conference has become. Because we've moved far beyond just Utah itself. We actually have attendees from basically every neighboring state, as well as a lot of foreign ones now, coming in, and we're reflecting that Utah is hosting a major technical open source group that really reflects all of the Intermountain area. So all of our friends from Idaho, from Colorado, and the other states, it's nice being able to meet together and be able to share a lot of our knowledge and to actually meet face to face, which we normally don't get to do that much. So the Open West name change was, was a big decision for us, and we're really happy that with the name change you still found out about, out about us, but that we were also able to grow. And that's one of the great things. This conference, we are now over 800 people in attendance, our largest conference ever. So thank you all for uh, signing up. And with that, also in reflecting the change in size, how many people had trouble deciding which classes they wanted to go to this week? Exactly. We have an amazing abundance of classes. The, the open source community has really stepped up, and all the different groups have kind of been able to share what's important to them. We've, we've got some great topics out there from um, all the different Linux groups in the area. We have uh, specialty groups like the Transistor, who's hosting an, an excellent room with a lot of fun things to play with. Uh, we have the Women Tech Council helping sponsor our, our new executive track, so a lot of business people and some classes that I'm really interested in, like the meeting with a lawyer for an hour, asking anything, meeting with a, a CPA, discuss getting your business online. Um, also, the various language groups. We have all the major languages with their own tracks this year. Every group has stepped up and provided some amazing classes. So, of course, the Pro group, the Python group, PhD, even uh, quite a few other fun ones. Yeah, even Java, they, they finally made it, right? <laughs> it's that startup time, it took me a while, right? <laughs> so, but what's really nice is, you know, the Open West Conference is a great chance for us to really showcase to the other groups around us, and it lets us get a sampling of the different players, so the Pro guys can talk to Python guys and actually have, have fun learning from each other. Um, but we really wanted to also help showcase what Open West is able to do throughout the year. So to help us with that, we actually have Victor Villa, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that we have this year. My name is Victor Villa with Utah Open Source, and I wanted to tell you about some of the opportunities we have going on this year, but to start, and to kind of give you some background on why we're taking this approach, I want to tell you about an email that I read about 3 o'clock this morning, with the subject line of, stop, emergency, big financial mistake, I thought, well, I better read this one. I'm getting about 100 emails a day right now. So I open it up, and the gentleman there starts to explain how we made a, pro a, pro a mistake in ticketing price. And that if you buy four tickets, it's very inexpensive, and people are going to abuse this, and didn't I know this, and didn't I calculate this out? And so I wrote back at three in the morning, two-word answer, I know. So I wanted to describe why it is that we did this pricing, and what gave me this idea. It has to do with the conversation that I had with Clint when I took over from Clint, uh, Utah Open Source, Clint Savage. His main drive was community. And every conversation that we've had since then is community. And I understand that there will be some that will always try to get the best deal, but I think that that's a risk that we will continue to make so that we can side on community and we can do things for the community that benefit you guys because that's why we're here. In this same vein, I'm very pleased to announce that we are going to sponsor a Summer of Code project. We're looking at our budget to see if we could do two, but we will link off the main site tonight, and you will be able to put in your project. Now, the big question, how do we determine 
which similar code project wins and gets money? It's up to you. On your badge, there is a number. And that number, if you are a write-in, uh, will give you, will issue you a number. Uh, so don't worry, just contact us. But this number is your uh, transaction ID, and it will allow you to put in uniquely one vote. So look on the link, and we'll get these summer code projects in. But I'm very pleased to announce that, that we are doing the summer code project, and we're going to be working in collaboration with uh, Bluehost on that. So the Summer of Code is a great event that we'll be doing throughout this year. Um, but also, like you mentioned, you know, Bluehost is one of the sponsors of that. But we also have some other great sponsors helping make this conference happen. Uh, like you mentioned with the pricing, we have in no way set out to try and make money out of this. We're covering the cost of putting a conference on and trying to help the community itself with the different things we do throughout the year. So some of the various video equipment you see, of course, belongs to the community. We use that to help record the different month presentations throughout the year and make sure that content's available for the rest of us. But some of the other great sponsors that have really stepped up to help out the community, and many of these year after year, they're really helping us. Um, one of the most notable ones, X Mission, of course. Everybody knows X Mission in Utah for the great ISP and the, the hosting support that they give for the, the very technical crowd. And they really step up to, to live the ethic of the open source community. And they are constantly there for Open West and for each of the different groups, providing anything that's needed, and, and stepping up and sharing the things that they learn at work and helping us out. So we're very grateful for their support for Open West. Some of the other great ones. So some of the other great ones is UBU for providing us the great facilities. Um, it's very difficult to get a room or a place where we can have this many people, especially on the shoestring budget that we try to run. So they step up and they've really offered us great facilities. They're running to help out with different media needs and anything that we want, they're there to help us. So they're proud to help Open West. Uh, Shauna Theobald, who is our, our liaison here with UVU, we could not put the show on without her. Shauna. So other sponsors, of course, uh, the one that I've worked for years to help out where I work is Bluehost. Um, Bluehost lives open source, um, gives very heavily to the community, both locally and across the world. Um, if you have any questions about that, of course, come stop by the booth. We're hiring. I need some help. Come on. <laughs> please, yeah. please sign up. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of other attendees in blue shirts, and hopefully by the end of the week, all of you will have blue shirts as well. Um, other ones, the Utah Open Source Group, of course. We'll talk more about this tomorrow, but it's a small core team of volunteers trying to help make this conference run. We've really put in a lot of hours, and we, we hope to show you guys what else we can do for the community. Um, Adobe um, definitely stepped up, helped out with some cash donations to help make sure we could cover our bills through the year and help get this book in place. Um, Red Hat's OpenShift group, um, they'll have a couple presentations. Please stop by and talk to them. They're definitely going out of their way to try and help the Utah technical community as well. So it's great having their support with that. Um, O'Reilly, of course, we've all read O'Reilly books. They've, they've helped out with some of the media sponsorship as well as the Linux Journal. So, uh, moving on with some of the track information, uh, some other notes. When we have lunchtime, please note there is a large cafeteria. Just over here, there's a, several food options, so you don't have to travel far away, and you can actually get your food, stop and eat, and enjoy it, and have time to uh, continue on with your classes. We also have uh, an unconference track. For those not familiar with it, unconference is just trying to provide the resources necessary for all those people who really just want to stop and have good technical conversations outside of the presentations. So we have some area in the atrium as well as if you go down the hall, there's this nice glass area with an overlook and some tables, we'll have some whiteboards. So if you just have a general discussion with someone you meet up with and you want to continue, we have space for you. Please stop by, talk, and continue your conversations. Let's get the open source working the way it's supposed to. 
Um, if you want to sign up also, we have a uh, time tonight for birds and feathers session. So if you have a larger topic you'd like to present, uh, maybe a group meetup, any kind of language specialty, whatever, uh, we'll have a whiteboard up just outside this hall that will uh, have space for you to sign up time to get a room. And also tonight, the Launch Up presentation. For those not familiar with Launch Up, it is the uh, small, business, small business incubator group, but running in an open source manner in Utah. Um, some really great entrepreneurs have started it up, and tonight they'll have their, their normal meetings, but with some added fun. And what they do is they help showcase local startups and have open discussion about what you're doing and how they can make it better, and they help feeding people who want to get their, their businesses online. So I know this year we have a lot of entrepreneurs. We also have a lot of tech guys that really would like to get their ideas working. So it's a great place to meet together, have some good discussions, get the contacts you need to get your business and your idea out the door. After launch up, there will be a, in the atrium, this area right behind us where the booths are, there will be an open social booth, so stay through launch up and get free food. It's always nice. And also, just as a notice, tomorrow, after the uh, classes end, there will be a social as well in what's called the quad. It's the grassy area just out the doors over here. So there'll be some food with that, and that'll be a get-together meet and greet between the different attendees. So with that information, I'd like to uh, present our first keynote or our keynote for today. Um, most of you who've been in the technical community in Utah for any time know this man. Um, Bill Winley, he's the founder of uh, and chief technology officer of Kinetics. So Kinetics, it's a really interesting technology that they provide some cloud-based application platforms uh, for creating, as they say, the, the internet of my things. Um, and the API of me, if I gotta remember that one. So he's an adjunct professor at uh, computer science at Brigham Young University and teaches courses on reputation, digital identity, and large-scale system design. So, Phil writes a popular, popular technical entry of blog, and he's a frequent contributor to various technical publications. He's also a frequent presenter at Open West because of his great open source nature, and it's very interesting to hear him talk. So, with that, we'd like to introduce Phil Windley, talking about the Internet of Things. So let me, uh, before I start, I want to take a picture of the group. Um, so 10 years ago, 12 years ago now? Yeah, 2001, I went to an O'Reilly conference. It was the first O'Reilly PC conference. And a guy named Dan Bricklin, who is the guy who invented VisiCal, stood up in front of the room. I didn't know him at that point. He stands up in front of the room. He brings out this big digital camera, right? Because they're all big at that point. <laughs> And he says, I'm going to take a picture of this crowd, and tonight it's going to be on my blog. And it was the first time I'd ever heard the word blog. And that's actually how I started blogging, was from Dan Brickman taking a photo of a conference. And of course now, of course, that's nothing unusual in Instagram and all of those things. I want to talk to you today about trillion node networks and the architectures behind them. Now, to get started, I want you to try and imagine for a second what a trillion means. Um, a million seconds is about 10 days. A billion seconds is a little more than 30 years. A trillion seconds is 38,000 years. Right? 38 years, 38,000 years. Huge difference between a billion and a trillion. We, we tend to kind of put them together and think, well, a trillion's a little bigger than a billion. We all know, of course, from math that it's, you know, a thousand times bigger, but it's hard to imagine. Um, right now, today's internet has somewhere between one and four billion devices, depending on what you count and how they're connected. So the question is, what will the internet be like when there are a trillion things connected to it. Now you might say, you know, I don't know that there could be a trillion things connected to it, but I think there's opportunity for a lot more than a trillion things to be connected to the internet. Now, if I can get the, there we go, that's the right button now. What's going to drive it? One of the things that's going to drive it is the internet of things. If you follow Cisco, they have this, um, they have this kind of blog where they talk about the internet of things. 
They have an infographic. They say by 2020, there will be 50 billion devices on the internet. But I think it's actually a lot bigger than 50 billion because I don't think they're necessarily counting all of the things that will be online, even if they don't necessarily have a processor attached to them. Uh, one of the examples I like to use is potholes. When I drive into my neighborhood and there's a pothole in the street, and I've got Google Glass on, what I want Google Glass to tell me is, your neighbor Sally reported that pothole to the city last Thursday. There's a crew coming out next Monday to how is that going to be possible? It's only going to be possible if that pothole has some online representation, if it's connected to the internet in some way. Right? So potholes are going to be connected to the internet. That's how we get to trillions. We're going to have literally everything is going to be connected. This experience is going to be different than what we think of computing now. We think of computing as being inside devices. We think of our phone and our tablet and our computer, you know, that you can only have one device connected to the network that you can use for this conference, apparently. Uh, right, but that's how we think of the internet, is we access it through our devices. When you imagine that everything is connected, the experience is going to be immersive and it's going to be pervasive. Literally everything will be connected and computing all the time. I actually think that devices, Moore's Law is going to drive devices to be like big pens. You are not going to care what phone you have. You're just going to pick the one that happens to be laying around. It's going to become yours. You're going to lay it down and pick up some other phone some other place when you need one. Phones will be like big pens. They will be completely fungible. You won't even think about owning a phone any more than you think about owning a pen. Now, I used to, when talking about this, give an example. I'll, I'll give you the example of uh, something that I thought was really far out there. So think about Moore's Law for a second and what it means. There are, I, I, I've been told that there are places in the world where you can buy an Android phone for about 30 bucks. Okay? So a phone that runs a very sophisticated operating system and is connected wirelessly to things. Now, what Moore's Law tells us, of course, is that if we can buy a wirelessly connected microprocessor that runs a sophisticated operating system today for $30, it won't be very long until we can buy one for $3. And then we'll be able to buy one for $0.30, cents, and then we'll be able to buy one for $0.03. Cents. Well, what happens when sophisticated processors that are connected wirelessly cost $0.03? Cents? Where will they be? They'll be everywhere. And the example I used to give people to show how far-fetched this could be was I used to say, there will even be microprocessors in the glass at the restaurant. Right? It has an accelerometer, you tip it over, the waiter knows to come clean up the mess. And then I saw this. Anybody see this this week? Budweiser Buddy Glasses. They have a microprocessor in them, and every time you toast somebody, it connects you as friends on Facebook. <laughs> So they exist right now. You can go watch the video. Just Google Buddy Glass and you'll find it. Now, of course, they're handing these out at the event and then collecting them after the event. But it exists right now. It will be disposable. Every paper cut you get will have one of these in it. And you'll be friends with everybody on Facebook. <laughs> but it's actually bigger than devices. Because literally everything, every organization, every person, every place, every place in a place, literally every chair in this room will be connected with a processor that is figuring out how to make that chair comfortable for you to sit in or something. I don't know what they'll do with it. But believe me, if we put a processor in it, we will. Every place and every place in the place will be connected. Every concept, right? Not just things, but every concept will be connected in some way. There will be online representation. There will be things that you own, things that you are associated with temporarily. There will be um, things that you are, have transient connections with. When we walk into this room, we will connect to the things in this room, and when we walk out, we'll disconnect from them. This will be the world we will live in. It will be everywhere, and we will live inside the computer rather than accessing it through a device. So what does the architecture for such a thing look like? Well, we don't know because we haven't built it yet, but we can imagine a few things. 
But before we talk about specifics, I want you to imagine a mountain that represents today's billion node network. Okay, it's a big mountain. And we're at the top of it. This is an analogy, by the way, from the book Trillions by Maya Design. We're at the top of this billion node mountain. We have mastered it. We know how to do everything. We build the most awesome web 2.0 applications you can imagine. It is so cool. But next to it is a trillion node mountain. Think about how much bigger that is. Think back to the 38 years versus 38,000 years. Think how much bigger that trillion node mountain is. It's a lot bigger difference than Baldi and Timpanovich, right? It's more like the anthill in your yard from Timpanovich. It's kind of the difference in scale. And what we see is people looking at that trillion node network, or that trillion node mountain, and trying to use existing tools to build scaffolding to get there. And it looks something like this. So here's my point. I don't think we will scale the trillion node network mountain using the tools that we're all familiar with today. Just like we didn't scale the web mountain by using the tools we were all familiar with from running uh, UA25 cables around to create LANs. Some of you are old enough to remember that. Now, to give you an example of why the current Internet of Things model doesn't scale, I want you to imagine some connected things. I own all of these things. Right? Radio stat, thermostat, a Fitbit. At least I had one until my wife watched it. Um, I, have, I have lots of connected things. And every connected thing I have uses exactly the same model. They want me to go to their website, sign up for an account, and download their damn iPhone app. <laughs> That's what they all want, right? Now, imagine... You're in your house, and you've got 1,000, 3,000, 7,000, 10,000 connected things in your house. Do you have an iPhone app for all of them? I mean, right now, I have lights that are connected via Insteon, and I have some Hue lights, right? Both of them want me to download an iPhone app. So when I go into my office, I have to open up two iPhone apps to turn the lights on. That doesn't work. The problem is that every Internet of Things, when we talk about Internet of Things today, people think end to end, which has this picture. It's about manufacturers connecting to the devices that they create. And this is a great thing, right? I love my TiVo, I love what it does, I love that TiVo's connected to it, I love that it automatically updates, I love all of those things. But it doesn't solve the problem of me having to open up two iPhone apps in order to turn the lights on in my office. Now, you might recognize Mark Benioff. Um, every time, I, I listen to him speak quite a bit because I, I, I like how he thinks. Um, every time he talks, at least for the last couple of years, he has talked about this thing he calls Toyota Friend, which is a Toyota Prius that tweets. The first time I heard him talk about this, I thought, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> But I submit that Mark Benioff is probably a better marketer and salesman than anyone in this room. Certainly than me. And so I started thinking, okay, what's he really getting at? He's not stupid enough to believe that people want their car to tweet. Well, this phrase at the top of the slide, social products and services, is what he's really getting at. What he's trying to get people to think about is products and services that are social with you and with each other. In other words, he's thinking about a picture that looks something like this. Not the Internet of Things, but the Internet of My Things. I don't care about the Internet of Things. I care about the Internet of My Things. Right? That's the Internet I care about. Where my TiVo is connected to TiVo, because I get great benefit from that, but it's also in some network that I control. And my Toyota and my GE appliances are able to talk to each other. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe my Toyota car, when it charges, needs to negotiate what time it charges the car with the air conditioner to ensure that I don't go over the, the limit and have to pay a surcharge. Now, imagine a world that we live in today. The only way you can make that happen is if you bought your car and your dishwasher from Apple. And then they work together, and it worked great. That can't be the world we're headed to. At least I hope it's not the world we're headed to. By the way, DE has dishwashers right now that have 3G chips in them 
and they can reflash the firmware in the dishwasher while you're on the phone with customer support. You have no access to that 3G chip, you have no idea it's even there. You call up, say, my dishes aren't getting clean. They say, oh, let me look. Say, log in to your dishwasher in real time. Oh yeah, your rinse cycle needs to be extended. Let's fix that. The reason they did that was because they actually had a situation where they had to roll trucks to fix like 500,000 dishwashers. Update the firmware. So how do we build the internet of me? Right? What, what does this look like? Well, first of all, we have to understand that it's not just about manufactured things. It's not just about the Fitbits and the Tebos and other things that I might buy. There are lots of things in my life that I might want to have connected for various reasons. We invented something called SquareTag to help explore this. And we gave each of you a SquareTag today. It came with your badge. And um, using square tabs, you can start playing with the internet of me, right? Um, square tab is based on a concept we call personal cloud. We think personal cloud, not just us, but there's a large group of people, large, a large uh, group of developers and other people who are interested in this concept of, of personal cloud. Um, we think that personal clouds are going to play a role in the trillion node network. We're at least in getting there, at least in scaling that mountain. They're part of the evolution towards where we need to go. Square Tag gets everything you connect it to a social profile, whether it is a connected device or not. So I have a few things in my Square Tag. Here's some of them. So all my trucks connected. I have a OBD2 sensor in my truck that streams data up to the, to the network. Uh, my gas tank is connected. I keep track of what my gas, my, my office and my lights, uh, bags, dogs, uh, you name it, I've pretty much got it in Square Tag. Now, Square Tag is interesting um, because what it does, it allows things to be connected, not just to you, but to other things. So, for example, imagine you have a Square Tag on your car. When I say tag, it's not about this thing, right? It's not about this, what they do with it? I put it somewhere. Anyway, it's not about the tab. It's about the identity. Like, the tab is just a way of getting to the identity. So don't get caught up in QR codes or NFC or that. It doesn't matter. What matters is a unique identity. This woman's connected to her car, but maybe Jiffy Lube's also connected to her car. She owns it. She can control it. She can cut Jiffy Lube off. But notice that there's a cloud for the woman and a cloud for her car. When you use Square Tag to connect something online, you're actually giving a little programming environment to the thing you put the tab on. It's programmable, you can write programs that do different things. Um, that's, that's why, for example, I have one on my gas tank and one on my furnace. I keep track of when I change the furnace filter with a little app on my furnace. Uh, it could also be connected to its manufacturer, it could be connected to service companies, um, maintenance history, service reminders, manufacturer recommendations, recalls and warranties, uh, service certification, OBD2 data, like I mentioned. Service certification is interesting. When you go to Jiffy Lube and they do something to your car, what if a third party could check in and say, yeah, what they did is actually what was needed? Do you like that? Yeah. A lot of us don't trust, not necessarily Jiffy Lube, but car mechanics in general, they're going to do what we want them to do. Now, to get a little bit more technical, when I say personal cloud, I'm being a little bit loose. The technical term we use is something called a PICO, a persistent computational object. And it just so happens that PICO is also the word that means trillion, just by happenstance. Um, so PICO is a little on online computer. Like I said, they have a globally unique identity. It's a little virtual machine. And these virtual machines run programs. They have persistent data. They look like little virtual machines that get unsuspended every time somebody wants to talk to them and then get resuspended as soon as they're done. That all happens within a second. Right, so there are virtual machines that are so lightweight you can unsuspend them and resuspend them in a matter of a second. Um, and they interact with each other. Specifically, they network with each other. They can form connections together, and they can be hosted at various places, and the connections happen between the PICOs, not between the hosters. You can even host them yourself because it's built on open standards and it's open source code. Um, now, 
PICO support a brand new programming model. And I'm going to introduce that programming model now, but there's going to be a detailed session about it tomorrow at 10.30 where I'm actually going to show code. We're going to write code and show you how this programming model works. Now, to think about this programming model, I want you to imagine how most web applications are built, probably all web applications. All web applications look like this. No matter what framework you use, no matter what architecture you're using, there is some business logic sitting in front of some database. And those things are inextricably connected to each other, and that's what provides the service. The problem with this model is it also creates a data silo. This is the model that leads to you having a thousand iPhones apps to control everything in your life. Because all of the data about the TiVo is in TiVo's data store. And all of the data about Fitbit is in Fitbit's data store. But wait, you say, APIs are going to solve that. I don't think we have enough time for all the APIs that we need to solve that. I don't think there's enough programmers in the universe to build enough APIs between all of the things to get all of the data between everything that needs to happen. So let me present an alternate model. In this model, we break the data store away from the logic, from the application. The application and the data are separated. They are orthogonal to each other. They are modular. They are loosely coupled. These are all things that have led to goodness in the past. I predict they will lead to goodness in the future. With this model, the browser is sitting in between the web application and the application data and mediating them. That doesn't have to be the browser. It could be some other system. But in other words, this application data is separated, and it happens to be owned by an individual. So in this model, all of your data, no matter what web application you're using, is sitting in a cloud that you control. So you use, in this model, if Flickr was built on this model, all of your pictures would be stored in your cloud, not in Flickr's database. Think about what that means. Flickr dies, you still got your pictures. Because it's all in your cloud. Now, of course, web applications never go away, right? <laughs> we don't need to worry about that. Once I put all of my life into these different silos and connect them up with APIs, it'll all work perfectly because they'll all continue to exist forever. We talked to you about an application that uses this model that I just showed you called Forever. I'm going to give you a little demo. Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk in detail about how it's actually built, but I'm going to give you a demo today so you start to see how this model works. So what you're going to see in this demo you're going to see a JavaScript app that could be running anywhere. And that JavaScript app has no database. It doesn't store any passwords. It doesn't store any user data of any kind. What it does do is it presents an interface and business logic. The data is all stored somewhere else. It's stored in a personal cloud. And as we mentioned, the personal clouds could be running on different servers. So let me see if I can break out of this. I'm actually going to turn around and turn my back to you because I tried doing this with my net turned around and I couldn't do it. Um, I've got a nice notification here that I've got a call that we're supposed to be on. Um, so what Forever is, is an evergreen contact address book. Evergreen in the sense that it's DNS for people. Think about how DNS works. You manage your own zones. You take care of all the mappings that you are responsible for. And when I need an IP address for a name that you're responsible for, I pull it in real time. Yeah, there's caching and all that stuff behind the scenes, but the model is I pull it in real time, right? Caching is just an efficiency issue. I pull the data in real time. If you set your caches low enough, you can literally change the IP addresses all the time, right? I get a different IP address all the time. Why do we do that for people? We don't do that for people because people don't have an online place that we can grab their data from every time we need it. And so what we do instead is we put all their contact information in our address book, and address books rot. They go stale. As soon as you put somebody's contact information in your address book, it's only a matter of time until it's out of date. Right? Um, so what forever is, is an evergreen contact book. So you'll notice that I have, let's hope that the uh, internet's connected. 
Yep. So there's my profile information. So I'm controlling my profile information in forever. And I have some friends. Uh, so for example, Allison, Allison Smith. And when I clicked that, it was actually going out to Allison Smith's personal cloud and pulling that data in real time from it. Was it? It's not stored in my computer. It's not stored in the web application. It's not even stored in my personal cloud. It's stored in Allison's personal cloud that my personal cloud has a connection to. Are you lost yet? I'll give you a picture in a minute. And you know, I can do things like send her an in-app message or send email or whatever. Um, now to show you that this is actually, and I can invite people to, uh, to come and do this. Um, to show you that this is actually going into my personal cloud, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the uh, data here. And, well, actually, let me, uh, let me log out. First of all, I don't know if I have a connection there. The, when I say connect to link to square tag, notice it says connect here to link to square tag, and you'll recognize a familiar OAuth dance that I'm going to. So I'm actually authorizing that app to use my square tag personal cloud. I'm going to authorize the app, and it goes back and says, congratulations, you're linked to your personal cloud. And uh, the, internet's, the internet is playing havoc with this, I think. Yeah, well, so much for live demos, huh? So uh, let's try something else just to be really exciting. So let me go to square tag. Uh, so this is my square tag, and if I go to my profile here, you'll notice that that's 5612. So in other words, when I updated my profile in forever, it updated the data in my personal cloud. So, so the data isn't in forever, it's actually in my personal cloud, and if I change this back here in my personal cloud to a real number, and save it, and then go to forever. And yeah, see, it didn't get connected somehow. And the network doesn't work. Um, yeah, notice it's 5 6, one again. So the point is, forever isn't storing that data. My personal cloud is storing that data. Now, to, uh, to show you how that works, let me show you a picture. So, um, this is Allison, she's using Forever. Forever is linked, like I showed you, with OAuth to her personal cloud. Allison has connections between her personal cloud and other personal clouds. So Forever doesn't actually know who your friends are. It asks your personal cloud who your friends are. That's how it knows, that's how it's able to tell me who my friends are, because my cloud has connections to their cloud. Um, so when, when Allison is asking for Brad's contact information, like I said, it's actually going up. Forever doesn't have it. My Allison's cloud doesn't have it. Actually, that's a little Brad's cloud, just like DNS, to ask for Brad's contact information. Uh, and notice that there's this thing called Acme widgets over here with a dotted line. These connections don't all have to be identical. They can have different types so that we can have different kinds of connections. Maybe because this is a connection I don't trust so much, the only thing they can do is message me in app. They can't actually download my personal contact data because I'm protecting that, but with with policy. Okay. So the point here is not: Do you think the world needs an evergreen contact application? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. The point of forever is to demonstrate this model where applications don't have backend data. Now you guys are probably some of you are thinking, "Hey, that's cool." And some of you are thinking, but I like to have the backend data. Don't take my backend data away from me. Um, yeah, people are going to take their backend data away from me. So, you know, the, the, I, I think that this model, maybe not our implementation of this model, but this model is inevitable. That we are all going to have personal clouds of some kind. It's the only way I or other people have have come up with it seems plausible for building this trillion node network. Like I said, there's a session tomorrow where I'm going to go through some detail. We're actually going to build an app, a to-do list, that uses this model. And I'll show you how it works in some details at 10.30 tomorrow morning, I think. 
So this trillion node network thing, how, how is it going to change what we do and how we think about things? Well, clearly, there are some challenges. Um, you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, there's challenges with security, there's challenges with reliability. If you think about a trillion node network, think about a thousand things in your home that are connected that you've got to like update the firmware for and download apps on and you know reboot when they stop working. This isn't going to work. Right? You can't live in that world. So there's a reliability issue there. A bigger problem is modeling. Remember the pothole example I gave you? In order for me to drive into my neighborhood and Google Glass to be able to see a pothole and give me data about it, you guys are all programmers. You understand underneath that magic of Google Glass showing me data on the screen, there's a massive model of potholes and streets and cities and everything else. We have to build those models. Right? Your world is going to be modeled. How does that happen in a way that's reasonable? I don't know. That's a huge challenge. I mean, my mom is not going to sit down and model her world. I don't want to sit down and model my world. I can't get Steve to model his world. Um, how's it going to happen? I don't know. It's, it's got to emerge from our gestures in some way. So you guys are smart. Figure it out. Um, so is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Um, I think it's likely, like most things in life, to be somewhere in the middle. But there's a role that every person in this room plays and how it turns out. Kevin Kelly, the original editor of Wired Magazine, wrote a book called Tech What Technology Wants. A little bit of a provocative title, you know, because of course technology isn't even an, an inanimate thing. It's not a thing. It's a concept. How can it want anything? His point is, is that some things are inevitable. Once we understood particle physics, a nuclear bomb was inevitable. There was no way it was not going to get built. Doesn't mean it was going to get built in 1945 by a group of engineers in New Mexico trying to win a war. Doesn't mean that. What it does mean is somebody somewhere was going to create a nuclear bomb. It was inevitable. I believe this trillion node network is inevitable. It will get built. What will it look like? Well, that's up to every one of you. I believe that every developer has an ethical responsibility to build the world they want to live in. If you're building some other world, if you're working someplace and you're thinking, this is a little creepy, I wouldn't want to live in a world where everybody did this, quit. Stop doing that. Now, this is an open source crowd, so most of you are, you know, you know working on, you know, building, you know, daisies and you know, other great kinds of beautiful things out of open source software. But there are people, right, who are doing creepy things. Um, and somebody tweeted uh, a couple of weeks ago about seeing a picture they'd taken of their kid on Facebook in an advertisement directed at them. That's creepy. Uh, so build the world you want to live in. So how do you figure out more about this? So here's some recommended reading. Um, apparently I lost a, uh, an edit that's supposed to be Mirror Worlds by David Gortner. He's the Yale University professor who's famous for not only doing some interesting work, but also uh, getting blown up by the Unabomber. Um, so if you can't find him, you know, just Unabomber University professor, you'll find him. Mirror Worlds. This book was written in 1995 or 94, before the web even was around. His description of this trillion node network world is actually amazing, given how long ago that book was written. Uh, some of it's a little out of date, but it's still worth reading. Snow Crash. In 1999, in a meeting with Mark Andreessen, who some of you probably know is the guy that invented the modern browser, comes into the room, says, have you read Snow Crash? No. Well, then I can't even have this conversation with me. I understand from people who know him, he still does that. Not about Snow Crash, but about other books. But it's that good. Uh, it's a little dated, it's you know, from the 90s, but still the picture of a world where everything is connected and com computation is immersive, I think is very compelling. The same thing with Rainbow's End by Werner Vinge. You ever read Rainbow's End? It's probably about 200 pages too long to tell the story. That's because there's 200 pages of description about what an immersive 
computational world looks like. It, it's really rather amazing. And then the book, Trillions, by Lucas Bailey and McManus, is very good. It's, it's where like, those picture, pictures of the mountains came from in that analogy. Um, it, it's not technically deep. It's more uh, conceptual, but it's very, it's very much worthwhile. Of course, I can't you know, not plug my own book. Of course, you should read that. That's going to change your life. Um, and again, the edits didn't come through. This is my old blog, so this won't help you find the right things. But anyway, if you go to my blog, it won't look at all like this because it's been redone. But there is a live web series of white papers, and there's actually a white paper up there right now that I just put up yesterday on forever. And on this model of, of taking the data and web application and separating them. Right? That's what that white paper is about. So go find this live web series of white papers. Um, and then finally, um, if you uh, go to developer.kinetics.com, we have a full developer program. Um, there's not very many of us right now, so sometimes things get a little um, out of whack, but, but we're, we're happy to have developers. Um, right now, the model that I'm talking to you about with Forever, we're actually probably looking for two or three committed alpha developers who would like to work on this model. Because it's still a little rough. I mean, this is not, you know, we're not announcing that this is ready for prime time. But if you're interested in this model and how it might make sense with some of what you're doing, I'd invite you to come talk to us, uh, see, if, see if we can uh, get something together. So here's my contact information. I'm pjwkinetics.com. I'm Wimbley on Twitter. I'm Wimbley almost everywhere because I'm an early adopter and I have an unusual name. And uh, my blog is at wimbley.com. So, thank you. <laughs>